So what are the principles of management of somebody who's presenting with what seems to be a community-acquired pneumonia? Well, first of all, you need to confirm the diagnosis. Then you need to assess the severity, and then you need to think about treatment, and that has three main components to it. Correct the oxygenation, because that's the risk for mortality. Treat the fluid balance. Again, hypotension is a, a risk for the patient. And three, clearly, it's an infection, and you need to kill the pathogen, and that's going to require antibiotics. And then you need to monitor to make sure that the patient's improving with whatever management you've instigated. So to take these in turn, confirming the diagnosis, essentially, that's a chest x-ray. You think the patient has some crackles over the right lung and they're presenting with a fever, then you need to know whether there's consolidation present. So do a chest X-ray and it might show lobar consolidation as is shown here in the right lower lobe in this chest X-ray. It's also very important to do a chest X-ray to look for complications. And we'll discuss some of those later in this talk. But we're talking largely about pleurofusion. And there may be related pathologies. So, for example, if you have a lung tumour, which is blocking a bronchus, then you'll get pneumonia distal to that, uh, it, distal to that obstruction quite easily. So a chest X-ray might help identify patients who have coexistent pathology, which is relevant, such as a lung cancer. And also, it will help confirm that there isn't another diagnosis present and that you've been fooled and this is not your pneumonia. For example, pulmonary edema, etc. Sometimes you might need to do more extensive radiological investigations such as a CT thorax or a CT pulmonary angiogram, but that's unusual. And if you're really worried about heart disease, then you're going to need to do an ECG echocardiogram. Now, blood tests are quite useful in patients with pneumonia because there is a certain uh, abnormalities that may show up. For example, if somebody's got an acute infection, you might expect the white cell count to go high, to be raised as an inflammatory response. That's true. It happens a lot in pneumonia, but also a low white cell count is also characteristic of infection in these patients as well. The ure urea and electrolytes can show a significant abnormalities, commonly a raised urea and a raised creatinine due to a degree of acute kidney injury. And often patients have a low sodium as well, a hyponatremia. Liver function tests often are abnormal in patients with pneumonia, a high ALT and a high alkaline phosphatase. And the albumin is one of those markers of acute infection. So, for example, if somebody gets acute pneumococcal pneumonia, their albumin may drop from its normal range of about 40 down to 25 very quickly. So hypoalbuminemia is a marker of infection. Possibly the most important blood test is the C-reactive protein. This is a marker of inflammation. So if you have pneumonia, it's infection. There should be a very significant inflammatory response. So the C-reactive protein, which is normally less than 5, goes up very rapidly in most patients with pneumonia. So if you have a C-reactive protein which has not gone above 40, you might want to think about the diagnosis in a bit more detail because it may not be pneumonia. In fact, it's not uncommon for it to be above 100, 200, and even 500 or 600 in patients with acute pneumonia. The other blood tests we need to do are tests for oxygenation, which I'll discuss later. And there are some blood tests which are tests for potential infecting pathogens, which I'll also discuss later. So what's the differential diagnosis of somebody presenting with what you might think is community-acquired pneumonia? Well, we actually mentioned already acute bronchitis, influenza bronchitis are two of the main differential diagnoses. The important thing there is they do not normally have evidence consolidation. If you have evidence consolidation either clinically or on the x-ray, then that means the patient has a pneumonia rather than just a simple acute tracheobronchitis. Then there are a range of common non-infective respiratory diseases which really need to be considered for anybody presenting with an acute respiratory problem. Pulmonary emboli, pulmonary edema, acute respiratory distress syndrome, not that common but very important, and lung cancer. Now, the top two, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary edema, they're common causes of acute respiratory problems. And they're not infective, so that you should be able to distinguish in most patients a pneumonia from those. But if you look at the data, many patients with pulmonary emboli are misdiagnosed with pneumonia initially. And the same for pulmonary edema. So that needs to be considered in the differential diagnosis. Lung cancer, because of this ability to cause infection distal to where a lung cancer may be obstructing the bronchus, needs to be thought about, especially in the patients who are over 50 who smoke. Just think there may be a lung cancer underlying this problem, or that the X-ray shadowing that you're seeing is not consolidation, but a large tumour instead. ARDS is the subject of another lecture. 
Uh, it presents with bilateral consolidation and marked hypoxia, and is actually a consequence of pneumonia frequently. It can also occur in situations where there is, uh, without pneumonia, and that's a relatively common presentation of bilateral consolidation, which might be confused with pneumonia in some certain circumstances. In addition, there are a range of relatively unusual and rare lung conditions which cause inflammation and consolidation, or what looks like consolidation on an X-ray. And these, because they cause inflammation and systemic upset and have X-ray changes suggestive of consolidation, could easily be confused with pneumonia. Now, fortunately, they're very rare, but they do need to be considered in patients who are not improving. So these include diseases such as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, a non-infective form of consolidation, pulmonary eosinophilia, and that's where you get eosinophil forming consolidation in the lungs, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is a, uh, a subject of one of the airways talks, hypersensitive pneumonitis and vasculitis, which are discussed in uh, the interstitial lung disease talks and the pulmonary vascular talks, respectively. So, for example, this is a patient, it's a 40-year-old man. He's had two weeks of fever and breathlessness, and a C-reactive protein shows there's quite active inflammation with a CRP of 222. Now, not unreasonably, he's been treated with antibiotics because it's thought that he may have an infection, a pneumonia, but he's not getting better. And in fact, it turns out that he has a disease, and you can see this here, which is causing an eosinophilic infiltration a consolidation in both lungs and as outlined by these uh, the circles there and this disease is called pulmonary eosinophilia and the treatment that's required in these circumstances is corticosteroids and with that he gets better so this is an unusual disease but it's an example of what could be confused as community acquired pneumonia but I just have to reiterate these are rare diseases and they're only really considered in patients who are not getting better with antibiotics You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.